Hey you guys, it's Donna from fedupwithfatigue.com and today I have a book review. It's uh, the Mayo Clinic Guide to Fibromyalgia. So at the uh, beginning of uh, December, I think it was, uh, Mayo Clinic uh, reached out to me and asked if I would be willing to review their new fibromyalgia book. And of course I said yes. And my plan had been to um, read this over the holiday and then do a written review, probably late December, early January. And of course, we can see that it's the middle of February and I still haven't been able to do it. And part of that is because um, I've just been struggling a lot with um, some cognitive issues. Um, you guys know that I've talked about before how it's uh, sometimes it's difficult for me to um, read and reading comprehension these days and um, that has just sort of gotten gotten worse um, along with just having a lot of difficulty even like writing articles and uh, doing interviews and that kind of thing basically anything that requires a lot of uh, focus and concentration and creativity and details that kind of thing I'm really kind of struggling with because of um, having intracranial hypertension now which uh, some of you probably know that I added that diagnosis to my already list of diagnosis um, in uh, January of 2019. Yeah. So anyway, um, because it had been so long since they sent me the book, I decided over the weekend I was just going to go ahead and purchase the uh, Audible version and listen to it uh, over the weekend. That that might be easier than me trying to trying to make sense of it, reading it. <laughs> um, finished the, the book up, I think, on Monday, and uh, then I made the decision I was just gonna do a video review instead of trying to um, slog through writing it, which is really difficult for me right now. Um, so this book, I actually have uh, mixed feelings about it, and I'm gonna kinda go through a few of the pros and the cons. Um, I'm going to preface this by saying these are just my opinions and you know what everybody says about opinions everyone's got one um, someone else may look at this book read it and feel completely differently about it so this is just purely my opinion and also to fully disclose uh, Mayo Clinic did give me this book in exchange for this review so I have to disclose that um, according to government regulations so let's launch in so I'm gonna start with the the pros first uh, the first pro is it's a really pretty book. I mean, they they did a, a nice job on the presentation for the book. And as you can see, uh, there's, you know, lot, lots of nice color photography. There are graphics. You know, there's, you know, different sizes of text. They have, you know, different, different fonts. The graphics are in, you know, nice colors. Um, so, you know, compared to other fibromyalgia books I've encountered, this is a, a really well done, uh, it's presented really well, because um, most of the other books I've encountered over the years are just, you know, uh, typical books with black text and maybe some line drawings or something. So, um, presentation-wise, if you're someone who is, is pretty visual and likes pretty things to look at, you'll, you'll like this. Um, so that's, that's kind of a cosmetic thing. Um, and I've got some notes over here to the side, so if I'm looking off, that's I'm just looking at my notes. Um, chapter two, uh, I was just going to highlight some of the chapters that I thought were interesting. Chapter two covers the, the history of fibromyalgia, and um, I thought that chapter was pretty interesting because, you know, fibromyalgia diagnoses were really just becoming more common, like probably in the 1990s, which is around the uh, time that my mother was uh, diagnosed with it. And prior to that, you know, we had uh, illnesses. We definitely had people that had illnesses that uh, looked like fibromyalgia, but they may not have been uh, called that. They're called by different names. And um, in chapter two, I'm probably not going to be able to find it, but they even have like a little chart where, let me see if I can find it. Yeah, here it is. They even have a little chart where they go, and I don't know how well you're gonna be able to see that, but where they kind of go by the year and what, what uh, the illness that was, um, that would be a, um, equal to fibro today, what that would have been called. 
and um, they were actually able to trace it back to biblical times, so that, that was kind of interesting to me. Uh, another chapter I really enjoyed was actually chapter 3, and chapter 3 is on the myths versus facts of fibromyalgia, so they go through some of the common things that you might hear about fibro, like myth number one, fibromyalgia isn't real. Myth number two, fibromyalgia is a mental health disorder. Uh, myth number five, you're just looking for attention. Uh, myth number six, you're a hypochondriac. Uh, myth number seven, you're just lazy. So um, they kind of go through, it looks like 11 different myths and then they kind of um, dispel those myths and give more accurate understanding of, of fibromyalgia. And um, I was thinking as I was listening to it that this would be really, really wonderful information to share with family and friends, particularly if you have family and friends who don't, may not believe fibromyalgia is real. They may believe, you know, that you're not really sick, that kind of thing. You know, because this is written by put out by the Mayo Clinic, written by, you know, practitioners who actually work at the Mayo Clinic. Mayo Clinic is considered to be one of the best uh, health systems in the entire world. So it really gives some credence to what you've been trying to tell the people in your life about fibro when you have people from like a top-notch facility like Mayo Clinic, um, you know, saying, no, this is, this is like a legitimate condition. Your loved one is, is really in pain. They're really suffering. So, um, I thought they did a really nice job on that. Um, another thing that I liked about the book, um, there's a section in the book where they actually talk about, uh, Mayo Clinic's fibromyalgia program. And, um, if I'm remembering correctly, that program is available at their facility in Minnesota, which I think is their main their main uh, facility, and then uh, also at one of their facility down in uh, Florida. I think it was Jacksonville. I apologize if I got the city wrong on that. But I just thought, um, I found that really interesting, and I thought, you know, how amazing would it be to be able to go into participating in that, in that kind of program? So if you're somebody who you know, lives in those states, it might be worth, you know, checking out and seeing if you could go there because I just think that would be an amazing experience to um, go through and see like what the program all entails and what they're recommending. Um, you know, obviously because it's uh, Mayo Clinic, uh, the content in the book uh, tends to be um, it's more main, mainstream uh, treatments and suggestions for fibromyalgia and um, stuff that is uh, backed by, you know, multiple research studies and that kind of thing. And so a big, uh, a, a chunk of the book is devoted to exercise. And, um, you know, we know that multiple studies at this point have looked at uh, how exercise can benefit fibromyalgia. And so they, they definitely devoted, um, you know, a lot of space to exercise. There's a chapter uh, completely devoted to it, and um, they give lots of options, kind of discussed, like what does the research say is the, the best types of exercise for fibromyalgia. And then they also give some recommendations for how to start a new exercise regimen uh, without uh, making your symptoms much worse and how to do that in a very paced, uh, gradual way um, so that you um, can slowly increase your exercise tolerance over time. So I thought that was really good advice. Um, there's a quote on page 93 that I was really, I was really happy to read because um, I think it's not, it's not said enough in the world of fibromyalgia, and um, I was glad to read this. As soon as I read it, I was like, yes, I'm so glad they said that. Um, I'm going to read it to you. It says, drug therapy is rarely recommended as the only treatment for fibromyalgia symptoms. It may help, but it should be used as only one part of a comprehensive plan. A research bears this out. In one analysis, all of the management strategies people with fibromyalgia found to be most effective were non-drug therapies. And um, I just thought it was really good that they pointed out that um, 
there is no magic pill for fibromyalgia, you know, there, and there's, there's definitely a, um, portion of the fibro community, and I, I definitely fell into this, um, portion early on in my diagnosis where, you know, I had seen the Lyrica commercials on TV, and, you know, if you watch the Lyrica commercials, you would be led to believe, well, you get your diagnosis of fibro, and then you take Lyrica, and you just are able to go to the county fair, and the, um, plant flowers in your garden, and life is just going to be completely normal, and, you know, we all know if you've got fibromyalgia, we know that's just not a reality. So, um, you know, I, I've thought for a long time that, you know, you really have to attack fibro from all different angles, and it really does, you know, drugs can be part of the solution. A lot of people benefit from uh, pharmaceuticals, and I, I uh, use a combination of pharmaceuticals and natural treatments myself and, you know, lifestyle changes and that kind of thing. But, um, you know, depending on pharmaceuticals, that's really not gonna get you very far in, in trying to live a, a good uh, life with fibro. So you really do have to sort of overhaul your, your life and look at all aspects of your life as far as you really do need to look at your diet, you need to look at your uh, movement, uh, what level of movement you have in your life um, you need to look at your, your gut health and your, um, you know, are you peeing and pooping well? Um, what types of exposures are you having in your household? So like chemicals and that sort of thing, you know, making sure that you uh, have access to really good, clean water that's not um, fluoridated and that sort of thing. So um, I thought it was good that they, they pointed out that, you know, there is no magic pill you know, drugs can be part of the solution, but they aren't going to be the solution. That just doesn't exist at this point. And I mean, I think overall, um, what I would say about this book, and I did also kind of want to go through some of the chapters. Um, so they have chapters about, you know, the medications. They have a chapter on cognitive behavioral therapy, which that is um, CBT, uh, is they've had multiple studies at this point showing that CBT can help uh, manage the pain of fibromyalgia. They have um, touch on in integrative medicine, so things like massage and acupuncture and um, that sort of thing, yoga. Um, they kind of talk about setting goals. Um, you know, obviously they talk about sleep. Uh, they talk about making uh, stress management techniques, that sort of thing. So meditation, again, yoga, uh, Tai Chi. Um, they talk about, uh, so I mentioned stress management. Um, they touch a little bit on, on diet and, you know, foods that might be good or bad for fibro. They talk about how to work better with your doctor, how to, um, I guess, educate your family and try to get them on board how to manage work and if are you basically are you going to be able to work or not um, and then at the end there is kind of like a way to um, make up a little little plan that you can follow like your own little treatment plan type thing um, so that kind of gives you a little bit of an overview of the content and I guess what I would say overall you know kind of wrapping up the pro section is this um, I look at this really as like a a resource manual for fibro so I think this book would be absolutely perfect for someone who if you are just recently diagnosed with fibromyalgia if you are someone who you know maybe you've been diagnosed for a while but you've been relying mainly on trying to um, treat it with uh, you know only pharmaceuticals and maybe you're ready to kind of expand your treatment options beyond that I think this is a really wonderful thing they did a um, they did a great job of just pulling all the pieces together it really is kind of like a reference resource manual the way I I look at it um, great overview um, and obviously you know everything that they're they talk about in here is more uh, geared towards the mainstream approach of what is fibromyalgia and how to treat it so that's kind of the, the prose section. 
Um, on the cons, uh, there was there was one um, just minor cosmetic. Well, I guess it's not cosmetic isn't the right word. One minor minor thing that I wanted to point out. Um, you know, I know that a lot of people with fibro have um, are chemically sensitive to um, certain smells or whatever. And I did want to say that um, the book does have a kind of a pretty heavy ink smell. I, I'm assuming that's because of all the color photography in it. Um, so if, and, and I tend to be sensitive to, you know, smells, fragrances, chemicals, that kind of thing. I didn't have a huge issue with, you know, holding the book and reading it and that kind of thing. But I think if someone was more sensitive than I am, it, it may be an issue. And so to get around that, you know, you the audible version is a, is a way to get around that. Just listen to it instead of reading it. Um, so that was just kind of a practical thing that um, I wanted to point out because I know that can be an issue for some people. Um, so content wise, um, there were a couple of different things that kind of bothered me content wise about the book. And one of them was that it, there just seemed to be a, um, a little bit of a disconnect in parts between the authors and understanding the reality of day-to-day of -day life of fibromyalgia. And um, this kind of goes back, I'm flipping over to, uh, I'm gonna give you guys a couple of examples. So uh, page 29, there was this uh, paragraph, and I'm gonna read it to you. And um, I think these couple examples I'm gonna give you are just kind of like uh, ways that you know, there's a saying in the fibro world that you don't get it until you get it. And I, I think that is 100% uh, true that, you know, only really somebody with fibromyalgia who lives with the day-to-day -day can understand what someone else with fibro is dealing with. And even though medical practitioners that treat fibro, they deal with it every single day, unless you actually have it yourself, it's hard for you to relate. And I think some of the verbiage in the book uh, relays that definitely. So uh, one example is on 29. It says, fibromyalgia will change your life, but the changes aren't dire and they're changes you can cope with. You'll learn how as you read this book and then blah, 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 blah. So I think the issue I had, and, and I actually had seen a, another blogger that she had, that she had actually pointed out the same passage. So um, I don't feel like it's just me. When they say the changes are dire, the thing is, is, you know, maybe if you have a mild case that the, your life, the way your life has changed from fibromyalgia isn't dire, but if you have a more moderate or severe case like, like me, I do think the changes are pretty dire. I mean, I've, I've lost the career that I love. I don't get to see my family and friends the way I used to. I can't, like my brother lives out of state. I can't, most times I can't travel out of state to see him. I'm not well enough. Um, you know, everything in, in my life is a, um, is a challenge and is a negotiation of, do I have enough energy? Is my pain level low enough? you know, even stuff that people just take for granted, like going to the grocery store. You know, that's a that's a big deal to go to the grocery store because of the energy you have to expand. So I think to say that the changes aren't dire, uh, that's just not, um, that's not my experience. And I don't think that's the experience of most people with moderate to, mo uh, moderate to severe fibromyalgia symptoms. Um, and again, I just feel like that's a disconnect of the practitioners not really understanding the day-to-day -day of someone who lives with, with fibro. There's another uh, example of this back on page 75. It's a, this one's in the family section. And um, so it says, with time, many families living with chronic disorders such as fibromyalgia come to accept the condition and work together to create a new normal. Okay, that's a that's a very, you know, standard sentence. Here's, here's kind of what I had the issue with. 
These families see that it's possible to live well with fibromyalgia by working together as a team. They don't ignore the condition, but they also don't view it as something that needs to be the focus of or unduly interfere with family life. Rather than make fibromyalgia the center of their lives, these families find ways to continue engaging in many of the same activities as they did before, even if they have to make changes to do so. And then it goes on. And um, I just, I guess I took issue with the wording, you know, they don't ignore the condition, but they also don't view it as something that needs to be the focus of or unduly interfere with family life. And again, I think this is an example of where the practitioners, the authors, um, there's a disconnect between um, what happens when their patients go home and what's really happening in the home. And the thing is, is, um, you know, good or bad, my fibromyalgia diagnosis, along with my Lyme diagnosis and now the intracranial hypertension, um, good or bad, for better or worse, whether they're supposed to be or not, those things are the focus of my life at this point because they impact every aspect of my life they you know i just had mentioned a little bit ago about how they are affecting my ability to work there that means they're affecting my ability to be able to make a um make a financial living they affect my relationships my ability to see my family and friends my ability to interact with my husband, my, my ability to be physical with my husband. Um, you know, that's something that, that has been an issue. Um, it, it affects everything, what I eat, how I sleep. Um, so, you know, to write in here that, you know, it doesn't need to be a focus. Um, no, nah, it's, it's just not, it's not reality. Um, so just kind of moving on, um, I did also want to let people know that there's a lot of what I call cheerleading language in this book. And, you know, that's to be expected to some degree. You know, they, they want, they want, they definitely want to give a very positive tone. And I understand that they, they don't want to do doom and gloom. They want to portray um, the illness as something that, you know, can be positively managed and that you know you can still have a life and that kind of thing so I understand the point of it but sometimes it was like in the book that they were just going too far and this is one of the passages that I wanted to give as an example all right and this actually comes from the chapter on cognitive behavioral therapy which is um, a type of therapy that's been found in research studies to be effective for relieving fibromyalgia pain and the sentence says with cognitive, I, I'm going to get a little sarcastic when I read it, okay, because it's just so, like, <laughs> I just think this paragraph is completely ridiculous. All right, so it says, with cognitive behavioral therapy, you're in the driver's seat. You can choose not to let pain run your life, and you have the power to deal with your pain in ways that enable you to live life more fully and enjoy it. <laughs> All right, so I've done cognitive, I've done a cognitive behavioral therapy program for chronic pain. And I can tell you that that program did not put me in a driver's seat, <laughs> whatever that means, right? It did not, you know, help me to choose not to let pain run my life. Um, it didn't give me the power to deal with my pain in ways that enable me to live more fully. You know, it, it cognitive behavioral therapy. I found it. I find it helpful from the standpoint of yeah, it helps to, you know, not not focus so much on the negativity and to reformulate your thoughts and to get them in a more positive direction. To you know, help with catastrophizing. You know, making things worse than they than they are. Um, you know, if you're if you're familiar with Buddhist principles at all, of primary suffering versus secondary suffering kind of thing. So I, I do think CBD is helpful, but I just think to say it's gonna, you know, just help you control your pain and put you in a driver's seat, I just think that's like, it's not gonna do all that. It, it's helpful, but it's not that helpful. <laughs> So that was an example of some of the cheerleading, you know, you, so you're going to, you're going to encounter some of those little pep talks throughout the book and some of the stuff you're just, you might roll your eyes out like, come on, that's just not, not reality. Um, 
I think what I would say overall, um, yeah, one other thing I definitely wanted to mention on this is because the, because the authors are from Mayo, because this is a, a Mayo Clinic publication, um, everything in this book is a more mainstream treatment approach or belief about fibro. Um, so uh, they do have uh, addressed uh, con more co a little couple of controversial issue issues like uh, opioids and cannabis. And of course on those, they take the mainstream approach of opioids. You know, there's there are no guidelines suggesting using opioids for treating fibromyalgia pain and for cannabis. They said, you know, it's not recommended, uh, you know, and I, but I would say on both of those, and, and yeah, that's, you know, on the surface, what they are saying about those two things is accurate. There are no guidelines recommending opioids for fibromyalgia, and cannabis uh, is, is not really recommended for chronic pain at this point, you know, as a f official position. However, I think it needed to be pointed out in the book, and um, I, I don't believe it was, you know, in my listening at least, that the reason those things are not um, being recommended at this point, it's not because we've done the research and the research has found them to be ineffective, it's because we haven't done the research. I mean, the research doesn't exist. So, you know, there's a little bit of a not exactly telling the whole story there that you know why these things aren't recommended it's because we don't have the data yet it's not that they just flat out want work right um so that was one thing i wanted to touch on and i guess what i would say in in summary um is you know if you're somebody like me who you have done a deep dive into the fibromyalgia research you've been following it for quite a while you keep up with the the latest fibro headlines and the the big research findings you have like like I have PubMed <laughs> bookmarked on my uh, internet browser. If you're somebody like me that that keeps up with this stuff, you're not going to find anything new in this book. This is this is all very straightforward, mainstream. You know they focus on. The three primary drugs um, from the FDA. So they focus on Lyrica, Cymbalta, Civella. Um, they, you know, talk a lot about exercise. They talk a lot about um, cognitive behavioral therapy. They talk about a lot about things like yoga and Tai Chi and Qigong and meditation and that sort of thing. The basically the the research studies that we've seen ad nauseum on what works for fibro. You're not gonna find things that are more experimental in here. Um, I'll give you a couple of examples. So like you're not gonna find anything about Kratom in here. Um, I don't think they mentioned, I don't think they mentioned CBD oil in the cannabis section. I might be wrong on that. So I don't think they mentioned that. Um, I don't think they even mentioned things that are very common in, in fibro, like the use of TENS. They definitely did not uh, mention anything like low-dose naltrexone, which you guys know I'm a big fan of. And, um, and you know, this is because there aren't large studies on, on any of those things. You know, the research is still small and or emerging. So they focused um, all on, you know, things that are definitely proven with multiple research studies or whatever. So this is, I think this is a wonderful book for someone who, like I said, is just recently diagnosed or maybe they've been focusing on more of the pharmaceutical end of things and they're ready to kind of expand their treatment protocol. But for someone like me who is, um, fully engaged with the fibro community and follows the research and that kind of thing. Unless you, you know, if you want a book that's just a good overview, just a good resource guide to go with, you know, your other stuff that you have, this will work. But if you're looking for, you know, some new ideas, some new techniques, tools, uh, new treatments, I, I don't think you're going to find it in, in this particular book.
but I will say they did a really wonderful job on the, the overview. It's, um, like I said, the layout is, is really pretty. Um, you know, it's, it's just a wonderful overview. So that is my review. And um, I will, I'm gonna put, let me see, what am I gonna do? I'm either gonna do a, a blog post and I'll have links to, all, to the book and everything in that blog post, or either I'll just put a link to the book in the description box below. But in any case, check the description box below. Um, they'll, like I said, there'll be a link to the book and or a link to the uh, blog post about the book. I don't know how involved I'm gonna get on the blog post just because I said I'm having some cognitive issues the last couple months and really kind of struggling so um yeah so i think that's it uh take care guys and um i hope you are feeling as well as possible today bye